John Carlin. He, I don't know, I thought he was going to wind up playing me because every time I used the brogue, he would try to use it back. And I'd say, no, no, only one of us. You get bitten and I talk about it <laughs> the way it was. And then I, I used to, you know, I'd play that he was mine. Put an arm around and say, Willie, no, listen, you got to, here's what you're going to have to do. And he'd look at me and that was the end of the scene. He just could not keep a straight face. We played fear, but we acted. John and I, man, we had scenes that went on for an awfully long time, and they had to be very, very carefully uh, documented in our souls to, in order to get through the damn. I had a scene with Johnny Carlin. I had a scene with um, Jerry Lacey. And it was one of those uh, conspiratorial scenes. And from the moment we started rehearsing it in the morning, we, we started laughing. And we couldn't, I mean, Jerry Lacey with that bogey face and Carlin, and we we're all supposed to be dead serious. And you know how it's like laughing in church. You know, you just, the more they get mad at you. And all day long, we just and got into, finally we ended up shooting the scene with Jerry talking off to the side, Carlin looking out that way, and me looking the opposite direction just to get through it. And uh, you talk to Carlin, and he'll, he'll remember that one. Um. On camera, I can tell you that humorously, Johnny Carlin and I had some wonderful, wonderful moments together, particularly in the early times when I was chained in the basement. Um, if anybody remembers that particular scene with the chicken leg, where John was tantalizing me with, uh, Willie that is, tantalized me with that, with that chicken leg, and we just had such a wonderful time with that. Uh, I did a lot of worrying as Willie. <laughs> Seems that I was concerned of all the terrible things that he was doing to other people. And was there some way that he could stop doing, which of course he couldn't. He needed human blood to exist. <laughs> so Willie was really in, a, in, a, in the middle of a great turmoil and never, never out of that. And worried to death about who he was going to hurt next. <laughs> Especially Josette, you know, and whatnot. <laughs> I got offers to live in other places to get away from Barnabas, you know. I think I'll take a few of them now as time goes by. They seem pretty good as I think about them now. <laughs> I don't think they're still open then. I was much thinner then. <laughs> I guess I was pretty much right up there until the end. In fact, I think I was right there at the end. But I wasn't Willie at the end. I was either Carl Collins in the past or some other character that I was doing. I don't think I was Willie Loomis at the end. Willie, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Willie left the show, I guess, maybe six months before the, before the end. Willie went to a sanitarium. He went nuts. He did other things. He became crazy. But you always seem to go back to the crux, to the beginning of the show, to the first year of, you know, of what it was all about. And then the extensions were tremendous. They went into the past. They went into the future. You had Wolfmen. You had, you had Frankensteins. You know, the Frankenstein character was great for Willie. You know, I like that. That was a Robert Rodin. Yeah, we had a, I had a lot of fun with Robert and the Frankenstein character. That was fun. You know, we went into all areas. You're talking heavyweights we had on the show. I mean, you have people like Joan Bennett on the show. You, you had weighty people playing these parts. You know, you just didn't have fill-ins. You had real character people, real good time people. We were incredibly lucky, or, or not lucky in the casting. There was a lot of good casting done on the show. And that's king, man, you know. You come up with the scripts and the good cast, and you're in business, you know. And we were dealing with subjects. The amazing part about it was the fact that it was done every day, half hour. And uh, that was it, Old Dark Shadows. It was not difficult to go to work on Dark Shadows. It was a good time to go to work on Dark Shadows. You knew you, I knew I was going to have a lot of laughs that day, a lot of fun. And if you're laughing, usually that means you're relaxed. And if you're relaxed as an actor, you're in business. You can do things relaxed. So, so that's what it was. It was a good time and uh, whatever. You know, and I did not have to carry the show. I had it easy with the lines, with the this, with the that. The Jonathan Frids. They had it tough. They had to be in every damn scene, you know, and lots of dialogue a lot, a lot of times for old Johnny, you know. First thing that comes to my mind when you say, why is it lasted? Jonathan Fritt is not even part of it anymore. Uh, quick thoughts. Johnny was on his way to San Diego. 
back in 66 or 67 when this thing started, picked up the phone and said, you've got an audition for this show. And they, he said, I don't want to go. He said, yeah, but please, just go. That show was Dark Shadows. He got the part and changed his life. I was on my way to California, lesser, lesser circumstances than John. And the same thing happened to me. I was, and I got the part that didn't have to read for it because they were firing someone. And uh, Dark Shadows was like, why am I doing this? I don't want to do a soap opera. I want to be a movie star. I want to do a Broadway play. I want to be somebody. I don't want to be on a silly television show. And the only thing I can say about it positively is that it was a lot of fun. It was really fun every time we did it. And to Dan's credit, we've got to mention Big D, he was a good caster. Now, I wasn't cast in the part, strangely enough. Johnny really wasn't cast in the part. He didn't like Johnny. And it just happened with the fan mail. The rest is his business and his doing. He put the whole thing together. But luck has got to be such a great part of this deal. And the strangeness of the show was, was amazing, absolutely amazing and fun. And if I remember correctly, I was not even under contract. I used to come and go and come and go and let, go back to California, come back and pick up some different part on the show. And why has it lasted for 40 years? I don't know, but uh, when I look at some of my s work on that show, it's as good as some of the things I've ever done in my life. Moments of it, different, different pieces that I can look at. Or somebody sends me an old, an old tape I say, wow, that, that wasn't bad, that really works. In the midst of all that, learning your lines on the subway coming in, you know, learning Johnny's lines. <laughs> and uh, just, just uh, but the truth of it be known, as far as an actor is concerned, you were waiting for your next role. You were waiting to spring loose and be something else. You know, in the meantime, you were doing Dark Shadows. When Grace and Hall first came on the show, I was, I was very familiar with her career. She's a wonderful actress. And she'd already been up for an Academy Award for Night of the Iguana. She had done that film. And she was a highly respected actress. So when, when Grayson came on the show, it, it made all of the rest of us kind of sit up a little straighter. When people like Thayer David and, and uh, Mitchell Ryan and Grayson Hall, you know, the veteran actors that came on to play those, those characters, um, it, it just gave all of the rest of us who were just starting out our careers kind of a lift. I mean, they were wonderful. I really liked Grayson so much. Um, uh, I have real fond memories of Grayson and little quirks, little things she did. Um, but understanding, you know, I think she helped me to understand sometimes what what my character's intention was in a scene that I might say, what in, what am I supposed to be doing here? You know, and Grayson, uh, I used to, it's the funniest little thing when I think about Grayson. I remember when, when I'd be doing a scene with her, I, I'd watch her mouth as she listened because her, uh, her tongue would go back and forth against the roof of her mouth. Has anybody else told you that? Well, Grayson, <laughs> Grayson probably wouldn't want to hear it, but she was terrific. She was very concentrated and always there. She was nice. Dear Grayson, Grayson I truly loved. Grayson was a mother figure for me. In a way, she took care of me, held my hand, you know, told me what to do, um, took me in as a friend, had me for dinner at their house, my wife and myself, over to, you know, their apartment on Seventh, up there in the, by the Wellington Hotel at that time. Uh, nobody like her. There was nobody like her, and there is nobody like her today. She was unique to herself. Uh, and I think to a certain extent people didn't know what to do with her.
I'm not saying dark shadows. I'm saying the, the, the business as a whole, theater, and not theater, but or movies. She was very special. And, uh, <laughs> God, what a laugh. Ah! God, so kind to me. So kind. Besides wonderful talent, we had wonderful personalities. I mean, on that show. They were distinct personalities. I mean, there's nobody else in the world except Grayson Hall who could play Magda. I mean, Grayson Hall... <laughs> all, I, all I remember is Night of the Iguana Oscar nomination I am acting with her I am on the same screen with her I'm doing scenes with Grayson Hall and um, she was human she was just like the rest of us she was an actor struggling, doing it forgetting lines coming up to it Grayson Hall was amazing I'm, I'm still hurt though, Grayson wherever you are, you, you said that your, your eyes are you're too narrow. They're sort of, they're sort of in the, they're not wide enough for the screen. <laughs> I'm sitting there in the makeup chair and she's telling me this and I have never forgotten that. Isn't that weird? You know, you remember these little things. <laughs> I think another thing, Grayson, Grayson, why is it that, like you said, uh, I was overacting a little bit too British when we did the first Dark Shadows movie. She said, Just take it down a little bit. You're being a little bit too British. To, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, you're right. You're right, Grayson. Okay, yeah. <laughs> but what a talent. What a woman. Grayson Hall was, was a, a Hollywood dream. She was just this magnificent wackadoola uh, combination of six different well-known old-time actresses. Um, everything was dramatic to her. I mean, putting on a pair of shoes was a major aria. But she was very connected. She was married to Sam Hall, one of the writers, and she was very connected to a lot of in places all over New York. So if you wanted to go see, you wanted to go to dinner somewhere and go see a show, Grayson was the one you'd see. She'd get the tickets, she'd get the seats at dinner. And um, I liked Grayson. I liked her a lot. My father wrote the original Dark Shadows, and my mother uh, was Julia Hoffman, and Dad was also consulted on the new Dark Shadows, and I uh, was a writer on it all, all of 1990. There, suddenly you'd be on the street, and people would flock around my mother and ask for her autograph. And um, I remember always being I mean, I knew my mother. My mother was not somebody whose autograph I needed, in, uh, except sometimes when I had to, um, uh, when I w was in trouble at school and needed her to sign something. Um, but um, I was always amazed that other people would take my mother's signature, which I saw all the time, as a thing of high value. Um, you know, it. it um, and then years later, I, I think I got Bob Dylan's autograph, and I was suddenly shocked because here I realized that this little piece of paper with a signature on it meant something to me that, that was sort of like what my mother's autograph perhaps had meant to those people back then. There's one other story I'll tell, which is um, I actually did have to have a, um, a, this is something that you can do if your mother's on a, a major international television show and you can't do if she's not. I had done something bad at school and I had to write a, um, a description of what I'd done and have it signed by my mother or a parent. So I fretted about this for um, like all night and finally I realized the answer and I went in at six in the morning when I knew she was be asleep and I told her, I woke her up and I told her that somebody at school had asked for her autograph and could she sign this piece of paper? And she said, sure, yeah, Matt, give me a pencil. So I, I got a pencil and she started to sign the piece of paper and I said, no, lower. And so she signed it on the bottom, and then I it, took it back into my room, and I wrote what I'd done on top of it and handed it in. And I don't think I ever told Mom that um, I'd done that, but in fact, I did do that. And, you know, kids, don't try this with your own parents. Um, This is the last time I may ever come here 
if Sandor finds the jewels. Don't even try to scream. Clancy. At your service, Gypsy, if you'll be at mine. Let me go. Not till you agree. Do what? Do what? You're hurting me. <laughs> when I tell Edie. Oh, so you're on a first name basis with Grandmama. She will throw you out of the house again. Edward threw me out of here before you know that. Grandmother never did and never will if you help me. Oh. I'll help you. Next time, I'll press harder. I think we should avoid that next time, if possible. You can, by doing something for me. Oh, you haven't changed, Magda. There will be money. There is none now. You're going to help me get lots. And in such a simple way, you control Edith. Beth says so, Judith says so. I read her cards truthfully. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. I've no doubt of that. Don't forget that I know you haven't had an honest thought in your entire life. You're after the same thing I am. Money. And you'll do anything to get it, and so will I. Now, I'll give you one-tenth of my inheritance after Grandmama dies. What do I have to do? <laughs> it's so simple, I almost hesitate to ask you. Well, tell me. Impress upon her how much I've changed. <laughs> Not even my cards could lie that much. Wait! I wait only for money. I offered you an agreement. I'll give it to you in writing. Do you think I would count on it even then? Perfectly legal. A paper. I trust no paper. Then you forced me, Magda, to hurt you. Don't. Touch me, your grandmother knows how easily I bruise. Fair David. Fair David. We, sh we were in the same apartment building. I would see Thayer David a lot after, after Dark Shadows. We were, lived on 57th Street. And I remember um, seeing him a lot. And then I think we all moved to Hollywood. And he came out and started doing Nero Wolf. Um, when I was doing the show with him, I was struck by this incredible actor who was so humble, who would say to Lila Swift, was that, was that okay? I mean, should I do more? Should I do less? I mean, am, am I terrible today? The guy had no ego. And he was incredible. He, this guy was an actor. He was a wonderful actor. I did uh, Savages with him afterwards, with uh, Salome Jens and Sam Waterston. And Thayer David was Otto Murder, or something like that. And uh, he got even better. He kept getting better and better and better. So this guy is 50, 55, something like that, and he's still getting better. And that's, that's a, a great thing to know, that you can keep getting better as an actor. So he's, he's my inspiration. I want to keep getting better. And I think, you know, when you hit a certain age and, you know, you're not getting the sexy roles anymore, the young rebels anymore, the this or the that, but you're, you know, I mean, God, I'm, I just did Claudius and Hamlet. I just did something that he would have been great as. He would have been phenomenal as Claudius and Hamlet. I just did uh, George and Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Another thing he would have been great in. But, you know, the, it's, he's my inspiration. You know, you get better and better in spite of it. Miss Winters, I presume? Yes, and you must be Professor Stokes. Am I quite different to what you expected? Oh, no. Forgive me, you, you look rather like someone I once knew. Please come in. The uh, gentleman at the antique store told me you were quite lovely. Permit me to say that was a severe understatement. Thank you. Let's go into the drawing room. We can talk in there. 
Barnabas. This is the gentleman I was telling you about, Professor Timothy Stokes, Mr. Barnabas Collins. How do you do, sir? How do you do? Is something wrong with you? No, nothing at all. Miss Winters tells me that you called her about the portrait she bought yesterday. Yes, I... I was quite disappointed when I returned to the antique store yesterday and discovered it was gone. Were you? You see, it was promised to me. Oh, but the man never said anything about that. Oh, it's quite all right. It was up to me to exercise my claim on the painting by last weekend. Sorry to say, I failed to do so. I hope you haven't come here to try, try and buy the painting from me. You're not willing to sell it? No. I'll give you $200 for it. May I ask why you want to spend so much? I've spent a good many years studying the early history of my family. In fact, I'm trying to reconstruct the lives of uh, certain ancestors who lived in Collinsport during the late 18th century. That sounds fascinating. Yes, it does. Uh, how have you gone about this reconstruction process? I've collected diaries, letters, articles of clothing and other authentic possessions. Of course, it isn't easy to piece things together, but I've made considerable progress over the years. One of my ancestors was a man who uh, worked here at Collingwood. Ben Stokes. You know about Ben Stokes? Yes, from what I've read in the Collins family history. I've read the official history of the Collins family. I don't recall any mention of Ben Stokes. Well, he is there. He's not mentioned very prominently, but he is there. Where did you learn about Ben Stokes, Professor? It seems he wrote an unpublished book of memoirs. A book of memoirs? How unusual. What's so unusual about it? Well, wasn't it rather rare for a servant in those days to even read and write? Yes, Ben was no exception. He was an illiterate until he was over 40. That was around 1795. Then there was an abrupt change in Ben Stokes' life. What kind of change? He'd been an indentured servant and was obliged to serve out his time with the Collins family until the year 1805. But in 1795, Mr. Joshua Collins suddenly gave Ben his freedom, a sum of money and a full title to a piece of land north of the village. Ben educated himself and worked his land until he died in his 75th year. Well, do you know why Joshua Collins uh, did these things for Ben? No, that's a mystery I'm still trying to solve. Well, did Ben Stokes uh, say anything about it in his memoirs? He probably did, but the book was in a fire a few years ago. The greater part of it is illegible. How unfortunate. <laughs>